wait a minute. Ugh. Guys, we have a problem. Looks like we're all going to die here after all. We've already seen two separate levitation spells, one of them activated by accident, by Sage of all people. You wanna give it a go? At least attempt to save yourself and your friends? There's nothing to lose. No? Okay then, two for two. One minute Sage is supposedly the smart one of the group, and the next moment she gets lobotomized once more. Can't have anyone acting too clever now, otherwise the conflict might resolve. And besides, the girls have a private pool of healing water all to themselves. Surely, they can just keep themselves alive with this ultra-powerful miracle remedy until help arrives. It healed Rosemary from death's door, so it must have some Fountain of Youth eternal life properties, correct? Unless the rules suddenly flip and the water works in directly opposite way, but we'll get to that in a little while. Looks like we're all going to die here after all. Nah. The fuck was that sound? You are all supposedly going to die here, and that is your reaction. Uh, if we die, we'll become one of the weird legends that students use to scare each other. <laughs> so there's that. All we can do is wait, though rescue's not likely. But if we have to gaze into the unforgiving maw of eternity, couldn't we make it fun? Exactly how much blood did you lose, Rosemary? <laughs> Enough to know how we can make the most of the worst, and probably the last, day of our lives! I bet I know what you're thinking. Gospel or Gauntlet! Oh no. What's that? The best game ever! Someone asks you Gospel or Gauntlet. If you choose Gospel, you need to answer a question truthfully. And if you choose Gauntlet, you need to complete a dare. What if you do neither? Then fun dies. Ugh. Sounds like a mercy killing. Absolutely confounding tonal choices. Is this situation supposed to be funny or dramatic? I find it to be neither, so it fails either way. But still, just commit. Make a goofball comedy, or make a serious survival tale. But you can't pretend to be both at the same time. Those two moods do not mix. The out-of-place silliness kills the stakes, and because the situation is supposedly still serious, the attempted humor also falls flat. Yeah. It's the worst of both worlds. Also, and I know this is extremely petty, but why isn't the game just called Truth or Dare? This forced fantasization of a common term is unneeded. It's different for the sake of being different, not because there's any logical in-universe reason why it would be called Gospel or Gauntlet, instead of the traditional name. The game is even described with the exact terms Truthful and Dare, so it might as well just be called that. I'll go first. Rosemary, Gauntlet, Gauntlet, Gauntlet! You have to... climb up there and stand on your hands. <laughs> Ta -da! Is it just me? Or is it strange how Rosemary's skirt exhibits gravity-defying properties, so that she won't flash the audience? In a surprising turn of events, the creators aren't so degenerate as to have their 14-year-old protact act as deviant fan service, only to then have her show the camera what she's got in the following shot anyway. What's the intent here? What's the vision? What are the creative team's views when it comes to this sort of thing? Is this an honest mistake? I mean the pants are there, purposefully, no one draws visible pants by accident. But is this the animation director not keeping a close eye on the process? Or different animators having a miscommunication? I'm just baffled by the inconsistent intentions of the show. Moving on. Now, I would like to introduce a writing trope here, or rather suggest one. At least I haven't seen this one given a name yet. The trope I'm referring to is when the author creates this massive contrivance so that their characters get stuck together in some enclosed space, like the cave we have here, and are forced to spend an undetermined time sitting around talking. The writer just has to have the cast speak, 
whether it be attempts at bonding, expo dumping a backstory, what have you. The characters are stuck, decide not to do the obvious to save themselves, spew whatever dialogue the author has devised for them, and after exhausting the RPG dialogue tree, then the characters suddenly find a way out, conveniently, right after all is said and done. The situation has the air of blatant functionality to it, the pen of the author is distractingly on show, and that's not even going into whether or not the dialogue is good or not. Oftentimes it's garbage, problems tend to pile up when it comes to slapdash writing. <laughs> But that's not the point. The existence of this artificial scenario itself is the point. This crap hole of dialogue, as I've coined it. The implications of the term should be obvious. Now since we are stuck in this crap hole, what vital information does the author wish to have the audience know? What nuggets of storytelling gold justify this contrived situation? Let's put it like this. Effective dialogue is supposed to do either of two things, A. Move the story forward, or B. Reveal something about the characters. If your dialogue doesn't accomplish either of these, you can cut it. Now this particular dialogue is all about characterization and the girls bonding as a group. And I'm being extremely generous here. That's the obvious goal of this scene. Success is another matter altogether. So what new information do we learn about the main four and their relationship as they play through for their... My turn! Sage? Uh... Gospel? Hmm... <laughs> Two years ago, one afternoon on a dark August Eve, Sage vanished for three hours. Afternoon and evening are different things. I was probably studying. Ha! Deceptress! No one studies two weeks before school starts. Were you kissing someone? Uh, mayhaps a young mouth breather named Cybold Double File? <gasps> I've never kissed anyone. That's how you get tuberculosis. What the hell is even that? So now we know that Sage has never kissed anyone. How illuminating. And we also get further proof that neither Rosemary nor Sage has any life apart from one another. My turn. Time. Gauntlet. Hmm. Give Rosemary a compliment. That's a dare? <sighs> Rosemary is... No! Look at Rosemary and tell her. You're loyal to your friends. There is no way for time to make that assessment. The show has given Rosemary no chance to be loyal or disloyal to anyone. This statement is empty praise, incorrect, and merely shows that the writers themselves were struggling to come up with anything positive to say about the main character of the show. Next. Okay, my turn. Parsley. Gospel. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, who's your least favorite brother? Hmm. I used to hate Thistle. But then Spurge almost drowned and Thistle saved him and I knew, I don't hate Thistle. I don't hate anyone. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops! Dropped my hammer. I should be more careful. I don't hate anyone. Ever. <laughs> I don't hate anyone. Ever. So we know Parsley is a dismissive holier-than-thou bitch, lacking any kind of self-awareness. That's not exactly new information, simply reinforcing the characterization we already got. Rose? Gospel? What's the best gift you ever got? Flowering thorn for sure. My mom was a great gift giver. Was? I thought she was just... Lavender's... missing. Yeah, sorta. Off on guardian business. She has been for four years. Uh, she went off on some mission. I figured she'd be gone for maybe a month or so. But she never came back. <laughs> I wish I'd known. I would have said goodbye louder. 
Oh wow, Rosemary misses her mother. I had no idea. What an interesting revelation about the heroine that gives her such depth. Just so you know, all you would-be authors out there, when your character bursts into tears for the fifth time about the same issue, the empathy of the audience starts to wear thin, especially since she has yet to take any active steps tracking down her mummy dearest. Asking questions would be a start, but this show is allergic to logical solutions, you know how it is. Also, this is not new information to anyone. Parsley and Time act as if they learned something about Rosemary, but this information has been publicly established to the entire class in the previous episode. The fact that Lavender is missing is common knowledge. Wait, legendary High Guardian Lavender was your mom? I thought she was no. dead. No. She's been gone for a while, but she's coming back. The fact that Snapdragon has to be corrected by Rosemary is dumbfounding. The statement itself is set up so that Rosemary can explain exactly what happened with her mom. No, she's not dead, she's just missing. That's the function behind Snapdragon's statement. But the mere fact that Snap suggested that Lavender is dead makes him seem like a complete moron. Judging by his confusion, Snap is under the assumption that dead people cannot have kids. Does he assume that when people die, their children just vanish along with them? This show really needed a dialogue editor something fierce. The narrative keeps wallowing in this plot point repeatedly, yet no one does anything about it. All of this dialogue is hollow and pointless. The creative team does not trust the audience to care about Rosemary and her plight unless she brings it up every chance she gets. And they are right to be worried, because there is nothing else to her character. <coughs> All of this yet again underlines the fact that the main story has no direction and the protagonist has been given the most overused and underdeveloped backstory a fantasy adventurer can possibly have. But hey, the issue needs to be brought up yet again, so that Time can start reflecting upon her own family issues. This is the point where Time spills the beans about the rot, the fairy woods, her dad staying behind, all of that. I already went over this. The only thing gained by this revelation is that Time's anger towards her mother gets contextualized as completely unreasonable, even by emotional teenager standards. Time's character is damaged beyond repair at this point. So far, she has been the sort of cool, sort of aloof, sort of voice of reason of the group. But this backstory reveals her as yet another massive self-centered cunt with no perspective. Before, her chastising Rosemary was rather cathartic, but now it just has this hypocritical air to it. This entire scene is the storytelling equivalent of Molten Fart Sludge. The characters are awful, the dialogue is lame, the tone is all over the place, there is nothing of value here. Yet, the creator saw all of this meaningful enough to craft this entire contrived scenario just so the girls can have this conversation. Every single stupid nonsense misadventure in this episode has been in the service of this scene, so that we end up here. Now the girls are closer than ever. Such good friends. Ugh. I hate it when feelings come out of my face. It's okay. We're your friends. <laughs> this is the emotional climax of the episode. And I couldn't care less. Since I can't stand any of the characters, their happiness means nothing to me. And as always, a huge thanks to each of you for listening till the end. For liking, subbing, commenting, it's all appreciated. And a special thank you goes to my supporters on Patreon. And an extra special thanks to my 10 euro patron Wyland. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.